Well, yes. we'll just assume everybody's here and people may join along the way, but I want to thank you all for joining me for, I think, my 37th Talks with Terry. And this morning, I'm happy to have uh, Stephen Peterson from the Be Great for Nate organization. And uh, we also have Cindy Gordon from Newport Mental Health, and that'll be our first section. And then we have uh, Matthew Netto joining us from the AARP. And we're just gonna talk about some legislation that's up at the State House. And anybody is, uh, we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, I will try to keep an eye on the chat or uh, you can try waving your hands and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll recognize you. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Stephen, do you wanna do you wanna walk through um, our bill first? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me this morning, Terry. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with Terry for three years now. This legislation, the Nathan Bruno Jason Flat Act. Um, so this idea first came up um, in a meeting with Senator Don Oyer and Senator uh, Seventy with some of the original members of the Every Student Initiative, some members that were very close to Nathan. Um, and they wanted to call it the Nathan's Law, which had a couple of things in it, but then we started working closer with Buddha um, and they told us about uh, the Jason Flat Act that was already in 20 different states. So that's a law that started in 2006 um, and has been changed a little bit in each state along the way. Jason Flat is a, 15 year that died of suicide back in 1999. Um, so we joined forces uh, with the Jason Foundation and Clark Flat, who's Jason's father, and we worked for three years on creating our own version of the Jason Flat Act, um, while also honoring Nathan, a 15 year old that died by suicide in 2018. Um, our first time around, I think we were pretty uh, excited to be able to be working on legislation and we threw a in it. Um, and we quickly found out how the political system worked and really we needed to roll it back a little bit um, without losing really the gist of what we're trying to do, really the, the foundation we're trying to build around suicide prevention for youth in our state. Um, so without further ado, the bill itself uh, requires suicide prevention training for all public school personnel. Um, that includes all teachers, administrators, counseling staff, custodial staff, uh, the contracted lunch service, volunteer coaches, anyone that's going to be interacting with a youth needs to be trained in suicide prevention. Um, that is what every state has been doing recently with the Jason Flat Act. Uh, there is no fiscal note attached to this bill of the 20 states that have already passed. Only one of them had a fiscal note. That was California, because in California, every bill needs a fiscal note, even if it's one dollar. Um, so our bill has a fiscal note and uh, there'll be easy ways around having to pay for training either. So um, I've actually spoken with Jamie Hain um, at Newport Mental Health. They offer free suicide prevention trainings to school or we offer free suicide prevention trainings to schools. We provide free suicide prevention things. The American Foundation of Suicide Prevention offers um, free suicide prevention trainings as well. The Students Assistance Counselors offer free suicide prevention training. So there's a lot of trainings out there that could be implemented into schools um, pretty easily. Uh, I know some schools already have staff through PR question persuade refer, um, and that's one of the the biggest and um, most re well recognized suicide prevention trainings around the world. So that part is all about the teachers getting trained, get trained every single year. So it's important that they're remembering this information and reminded of it every single year. Um, and one of the pushbacks we got was, will this just add for teachers? And the is no, it's gonna equip them with the knowledge they need to then refer students to the people that need to be referred to. And that's the school social emotional support staff. Um, the second part of the bill in terms of training is all students grades six through 12 have to do suicide prevention training every year as well. Um, and that's another one that's kind of already built into the curriculum in the state. So student assistance counselors off giving uh, Saber uh, Souls, it's the SOS suicide prevention training. 
um, that can be taught to health teachers that can then be given into the health class. That's another free resources that schools will be able to use. Um, that curriculum will also be developed by the Department of Education, which brings us to the second half of the bill, which the second half of the bill states that uh, the Department of Education must create a model policy that deals beside prevention, intervention, and postvention. So the, the Department of uh, Education will be responsible for creating that entire pre that schools then have to keep that minimum or go beyond that minimum when developing their own policies around suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. One thing that's a little bit different than about our postvention definition in our law, it also mandates that students that have had suicidal ideation attempts, they must be followed up with by the school as well. I'm really excited to get a recent email from Lee Raposa, Senator Seventy shared with myself, Representative Court Friend, about what Students Assistance is doing um, to put into place kind of policy where, like the dream model policy we're already seeing. So I'm excited to hear more from Lee Raposa soon about that is and how schools can utilize that free resource as well. Um, but I, that's really the Jason, Nathan Bruno and Jason Flat Act in a nutshell. Uh, we just got through the education committee yesterday and got voted through and we're expecting the full Senate to vote on it Tuesday night. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, it looks like probably next week or after spring break will be heard at the, the House Committee, and hopefully we have the same process and by June, uh, Governor McKee signing it into law. So yes, we're hoping that we have a hearing um, on the House bill on the 14th, but I won't know that for absolute certain until the agenda comes out on Friday. So um, if anybody's interested in following along, uh, and thank you, Stephen, thank you for your work on this and for the great explanation. Um, this bill is uh, H5353. Um, and if you all want to follow along and hopefully we'll have a successful hearing on um, Wednesday and the education that'll be on the education committee and they typically are have been meeting around either two or three o'clock in the afternoon and um, um, I, I feel like this is it's a really timely topic too since we've recently seen in the press that we've had three people jump from the bridge. I'm sure there's other forms of suicide, but when that happens, obviously it brings everybody's attention to the issue. Um, Cindy, are you familiar? Would you, would you like to join in or add anything to the conversation this morning? Um, I just, everything sounds great. I mean, this bill is really impressive. Um, I guess one of the questions I have, and I'm looking forward to hearing more and hopefully it gets passed, et cetera. And, you know, suicide prevention happens at the individual level, at the state level, at the community level, et cetera. In, in, in talking about bringing it to the schools, is there any, been con any conversation about bringing it like to the families or to, because the families are where you first see, or you, where you also see some of the uh, risk factors and so forth. So I'm assuming that when we talk about it in the schools and we have literature, those, those, that literature will go back to the homes as well. So just engagement around families. Um, so that's just one of the comments that I have or questions that I have. Yeah, and that would be built into the model policy that the Department of Education has. So okay. um, the bill does require them to have a committee together of outside experts. Okay. So when determining those things, um, I, I'm hopeful that new health will end up on that committee. I can't say right. for sure because that's a call to the Department of Education. So yeah. really once this this law passes, the, the lobbying just begins because uh, there'll be some fights to making sure that proper trainings for the ones being offered and the, the, that po model policy uh, really is up to snuff because like you said, suicide, it's a systematic thing that um, if teachers and the students know about prevention, but they're going home and there's no support for prevention, then it's not any use. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just to add to, it's just that, you know, Newport Mental Health, I, as Jamie has said, and as, you know, Dan has been involved in like, we're here for you, we'll do whatever, whatever is asked and whatever is needed, because um, it's such an important issue. Um, yeah. 
Um, I know we have a uh, Newport School Committee person here, and we have a Middletown administrator. Do, um, do you all have any comments or questions of how you would see this, um, how you would be able to accommodate this, even though the, um, good morning. I, I think um, <clears throat> perhaps some summer <clears throat> training or, or PD sessions for us to kind of dive really deep into this so that way we can start the school year next year uh, some sort of idea or legwork on what what um, we'd like to do would be great um unfortunately i'm speaking from the high school level we are extremely extremely busy right now because we are at the tail beginning of state testing um Middle schools, elementary schools are, are just beginning. Rycast High School, and the high school in the state next week will be doing SATs and PSATs. And we have April break, and we come back. We have makeups for those, and we have our science testing. And then our first two weeks of May, we have AP testing, and then after that, we have senior project stuff. And then the year pretty much comes down to to uh, a close. But it's good discussion to have beginning now up through the summer of planning on how we can map this out and then potentially begin the school year with some um, activities that perhaps are so, so perhaps our support group can use, but perhaps also have some lighter activities. What I mean by lighter, because I, I guess the biggest fear is, because um, I'm, I'm a big restorative practices advocate, um, a lot of the a lot of the concern that a lot of teachers have about restorative practices is in, uncovering things that they're not really trained for. But it wouldn't hurt to have some s small discussion or class lessons for those health teachers that they feel comfortable with sharing um, as well. Um, like we have that for for what when we do like restorative practices stuff, where we have interventions that teachers can use within the classroom that won't take away from their curriculum or their area of, area of expertise, but also stuff that they feel comfortable with. But then the heaviest, heavier load can go on to the support staff uh, as well. But I think if we start the having the conversations now and perhaps maybe have like a cohort of people or, or maybe like, like a focus group amongst all the schools on the island, uh, perhaps include Tiverton, Little Compton as well, um, talk about how we collectively as as five districts can roll out some awareness and in intervention strategies on on what we can do to help or I just or I just recognize the uh, uh, the signs what to look for I know the I think I mentioned this last time I, I was I was uh, on this uh, zoom the mental health uh, youth mental health for us states it's, it's very uh, useful training um, on the flip side, it, it does take time to go through that. So perhaps maybe us collectively as a group of professionals can provide some teachers with some tips on things to look for in a classroom to recognize that the student who's not normally standoffish is all of a sudden standoffish that perhaps that's a student that needs to be spoken to instead of just maybe they're tired today type of thing. You know, what, what, type, of, what type of activities can we give the standard teacher doesn't have a lot of experience uh what type of things can we give those teachers to use in the classroom where they're not forced or feel uncomfortable but also comfortable using in the classroom so right but, but i think if we if we if we start planning throughout the summer and what this could start looking like for, for for schools to open up in september not saying we push this off um i'm Right. I, I just think, you know, with the summer approaching, the school year starting to come to an end. It's a very, it's a very busy season right now. Probably won't get, I mean, you can send something out and say, hey, we think we're doing this yeah. in the summer. If you're interested, sign up. Okay, these are the hours, these are the set times, just for discussion with some of the things you're doing, what you're doing, what you're doing, what can we put collect, together collectively as a group so we can roll out to our schools. And then and, and who knows what, what, would, what would come right. from, come from that. I'm sure Ride would have some, there'd be some timeline for schools, so schools weren't under, feeling like they were totally under the gun. Yeah, and then, I mean, the timeline at this point, the house will hear it, and then we probably won't have our consideration hearing until 
first or second week of May, um, and then a vote. So this would not have this to you yeah. um, under these timelines. It, it wouldn't be, uh, the law wouldn't make it into fruition until uh, maybe not even till the second half of next school year because yeah. Riot will have to go making their model policy, developing their committees on citing the training. So a while out before it actually gets implemented. Agreed. So Louisa. So, yeah, so social emotional is a huge thing and now with COVID even more so. So I think this is very timely. Could you give, um, I think both you, Cindy and Steven, you said you both have sort of programs. Maybe you could kind of give us, give me an idea of like how, if you're giving PD to the teachers and the staff and so on, how how does that look like? Is that like, how long does that take? And because I think if it's mandatory, it has to be um, in a, um, a group setting. So it's not an optional, you know, usually PD often is optional. You get to pick and choose what you want. So it would have to be in a, um, uh, you know, in a full meeting, everybody would have to come in. So could you guys each take a little bit on sort of the Time lot, how long do you tend to have these programs and is there a lot of handouts or just talk about that, please? Go ahead, Cindy. Yeah, I can just speak to the, right now we're just, we're offering treatment. We haven't um, rolled out a program for uh, for the schools or anything like that. So we would have to build that. So, Training program. you know, we right. have, um, you know, we have a clinician right now that's working in the schools. We're gonna add another clinician in the schools too, to work mm -hmm. on treatment with the students. But in terms of an actual rollout of a program, we haven't done that yet, and we'll, we will work on on building one. Okay, so it'd be for training because what Stephen just said is it's training all staff right down to janitor. So that's a pretty significant Absolutely. program you'd need to have. That's got to be it's got to be kind of concise enough to get everybody to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. But um, also, I would assume there'd be um, some handouts and so on that could go home for parents, as you said, Cindy, and families. That would be critical. Yeah. So and, Stephen, uh, do you have anything? Have you guys pulled this together? So one that we do, we created our own, we created the Be Great for Nate suicide prevention training. Um, and we're still in the process of collecting data, but we have over 200 data points that show that it has a 300% increase in suicide prevention skills. Um, and we use a multitude of uh, already research back um, suicide prevention trainings to develop our, we used QPR, we used mental health first aid, um, we used the Jason Foundation. So we used all of those measure tools to measure our own trainings. So ours takes an hour and a half. Um, mm -hmm. We just gave it to over 50 parents at St. Barnabas Church because they've built in a prevention training into their CCD curriculum. So all seventh and eighth grade students have to go through it. So we just gave it to um, I think eight kids there plus 40 parents. Um, and we're analyzing that data right now as well. So ours takes an hour and a half. Um, and we took pieces of each training that we really liked and put it together. The reason we made our own is because this is no training program, short training program available to youth right now. So the only suicide prevention training youth can get in this country is through the, um, the Save Our Souls suicide prevention training. And that's, I think that's a 12 week curriculum. Um, so that's the only training kids can get. So we develop own, um, and we're getting it researched so that we can start offering it uh, as a SAMHSA evidence-based practice. Um, but we do offer that for free, right? Now. Ours is now QPR training, um, which um, there's a lot of QPR trainers here in the state, as well as the fact that you could get somebody QPR training for about $200 and they can give that training for free or for cost, whatever they want it to be. So I mean, each school district uh, realistically could ha could have one of their support staff members become QPR trained. Uh, that training takes two hours to go through. Um, the mental health uh, training or the student prevention training, the talk training that the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, that's about, I think, an hour to an hour and a half, uh, but we can give a little more insight on that. She's here with us today. So that training again, so all these trainings, none of them take more than two hours um, on these suicide prevention trainings that would be the acceptable trainings uh, the Department of Education would put on their list. Mm -hmm. 
Now, in these other states, you said that already the Jason Flack is in several other states. Do they require the training too? Right. So some so, of them do it every year. Some of them do it every other year. So each state is a little bit different, um, but they all require the training too. The Jason Foundation has also offered um, to give free training, but the issue with that is our bill specifically states uh, that it's person instruction, but they offer long um, self-guided instruction on suicide prevention. Why did you decide to have it only in person? So we decided in person, uh, just from what we found to be effective, um, mm -hmm. is that uh, if you're a lot of people to do it within their homes on a computer, there be some distractions, and this is far too important um, yeah. that we don't want any distractions. So that in-person piece, and I'm sure any teacher could tell you right now with what's happened over the last year, distance learning, that mm -hmm. um, that in-person piece is so important, and it opens up the ability to have conversation as well with the instructor. So um, like Dennis has talked about that practical piece of a teacher with their hand up and be like, okay, what if this is happening in my classroom? What does that mean? And the instructor is able to answer those questions. And that's really um, the beauty of that in-person piece. Mm -hmm. And you're saying to do that each and every year by law, right? Correct. And to talk for every year. Do you for think you... Um, I wonder, Stephen, do you think that a once we roll out the initial trainings um, that you could have uh, refreshers online? I'm sure that's a question that would come up at some yeah. point, and maybe that's something that Ride would have to. Yeah, or... that would be a right thing, but um, I don't think that would be an issue because, like you said, it's kind of that that practice over again, a refresher. Mm -hmm. um, that that's definitely thing that hopefully I'm part of the committee that Ride puts together and a lot of other people are, but I think that would be an important piece too, because um, uh, there probably need to be some sort of posts that they take after just, I mean, and if they need to go to in-person instruction again, they'd go to that, but yeah, it's a conversation with Ride. Um, right. It could be like you do some, like every two to three years, you go back to an in-person because, but to, you want to make sure it can happen. That's the right. most important thing. Right. And the other thing that I'm kind of hearing is, um, again, mental health, as we all know, is many, many, many dimensions and uh, suicide is the worst, you know, like that's that. So, but um, really coming out of COVID, the whole social emotional impacts are huge and um, the teachers and the staff and, you know, we, we, and leadership want to provide as much assistance as possible but we have to make sure it's um completely doable and not overwhelming and you know yeah. all that so i think this is good. good um matthew mccoy's got his hand up uh good morning, good morning. <clears throat> my, my name's matthew mccoy i'm a mental health first aid instructor i live in north kingstown and uh first Thanks off thank you for that. your um your leadership on this uh, important subject. Um, I just wanted to respond to, uh, I believe it was uh, Stephen. Um, the uh, mental health first aid courses now, uh, because of the pandemic, um, used to be taught in person uh, as an eight hour course. Um, sometimes they were offered uh, in two four hour sessions over a weekend. Uh, or in a single eight hour session over the course of uh, a day. Um, but now uh, they've moved online so that a portion of them uh, is done individually by the, uh, the student, um, in this case, the teacher. Uh, and then um, the like five hours of that is done together in a group setting uh, via Zoom. Um, so uh, this has been ongoing. Um, the people that I work with are part of uh, South County Healthy Bodies, Healthy Minds. Uh, they have a, a grant from SAMHSA uh, to provide these courses for free. And uh, I believe that, um, uh, that that type of program would work, um, you know, in the long run for uh, this, uh, this particular need. Um, there are obviously, as, as were, were mentioned, other shorter programs. Um, and, you know, the key is to make sure that everyone is left with uh, 
a good understanding of the signs and symptoms of somebody who is experiencing a mental health disorder and uh, could possibly uh, result in uh, them um, ending up in crisis. So um, I applaud everybody's efforts in this regard and, uh, um, and I, I think it's an important thing to tackle. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, are there any other comments on this um, topic? Uh, does everybody, if they want to advocate for a bill, um, you can uh, go to the uh, Rhode Island General Assembly website, which is rilegislature.gov. Uh, you can look at committee hearings and you'll get the schedule and um, every week the agenda is posted and there's um, a link where you, if you click that link, you can sign up to give verbal testimony and we actually call you during the committee hearing so you don't have to go anywhere. You can be in the convenience of your own home um, or you can also uh, submit written testimony and or both. So I just wanted to let everybody know that for any bill that you're following, uh, that's the procedure these days. And we have a place where all the testimony uh, under committee documents, every all the testimony is listed there with the bill number. So um, that is how to make your voices heard on this bill or anything else that you might be interested in. I just wanted to say that um, our Dan Wartenberg of Newport Mental Health is providing testimony. Um, Excellent. Okay. Great. Thank you, Cindy. You're and with that, I would like to introduce everybody to uh, Matt Netto, who's actually here from AARP, uh, to discuss some of their uh, legislative priorities, many of which are on the Senate side. But um, I will um, hand the floor over to over to you, Matt, and let you talk about. Um... Thank you. I appreciate it, Representative. Um, actually, you just mentioned uh, the testifying part and how easy it is to, you know, the virtual part of it these days. Uh, it's funny because we actually, AARP just held a training for our volunteers yesterday morning on testifying in a virtual world. So I do have a pretty basic PowerPoint slide that if there's a chat or I can send it off to you later that you could share with everybody. Um, we tried to make it so it's as general as possible. It's not tailored to AARP, uh, but it shows the website. It shows arrows and what to click on and kind of goes through the process of um, providing testimony. Yeah. You know, we, we, we really hope it continues past the pandemic the way they're doing it. Um, that virtual is an option because it, it we found that you know, it seems like many more people have the opportunity to have their voice heard now. Um, not, you know, even, you know, parents, families, some people can't go to the state house and sit there for three, four hours on a Tuesday, Wednesday night. Um, but they may be able to sign up and, and take that phone call from home. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting you brought bring that up because that's something we're working with our volunteers and our membership on right now is trying to show them how easy it is to have your voice heard these days. Right. Um, so you have to be concise um, yes. because different chair people, depending on the number of people testi testifying, yeah. may limit it to one minute or yeah. two minutes. There's a little bit of a lag. There is a little bit of science behind it, there or strategy is. anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. because, uh, yeah, there's a lag. Turn down your device before you answer the phone because the committee yep. can hear all that background noise and then we can't hear you speaking. See, Tia, um, I was just telling Tia about that. Yes, you got to find another room to talk in or make sure you shut your computer or turn the meeting off. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Because And there'll be a lag. So it's yeah. a little disconcerting because they'll be calling you and you're listening to the meeting at one point, but yeah. they're, the actual meeting is about 30 seconds ahead of that. Yeah. So, um, then you'll hang up the phone and you still hear yourself speaking. Yes, um, it's a little weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little strange. Um, well, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to come back today and speak with you all. Uh, in 2019, my predecessor, John D. Tommaso, had started a lot of work on lowering the cost of prescription drugs here in Rhode Island. Uh, he began working with many different reps, with policymakers uh, in, in our national office, to really craft these bills 
And we had it going. Last year, we had it up and running and all you know, the eight bills were introduced and we had companion bills ready to go. And then the pandemic hit and everything got put on hold. So this year, I just came on board in November. Um, and, and I must say most of my first few months have been related to coronavirus and a lot of work around, surrounding that. Um, but we, we were very pleased to see that many of the representatives that had introduced these bills on prescription drugs last year um, were, were willing and able to introduce them uh, once again this year. So we have, um, there are eight bills on the Senate side. There are five or six on the House side. Um, we're trying to get as many companion bills introduced as possible. And the reason we're doing this is Let's take one example. So, uh, you know, I, I used to work for the American Diabetes Association. So it's something that's very close to my heart. I know a lot about it. And I know there's a major issue with the cost of insulin. One of our bills works with capping the monthly cost of insulin. Um, one drug example is Lantus. In 2012, the cost of Lantus for an annual, annually average was $2,907. By 2017, for the same exact drug, same amount, same exact quantity, was $4,700 a year. Uh, as many as in 2016, AARP ran a poll in, in Rhode Island, and as many as 25% of people that responded admitted that they had to, they had actively had to make decisions on whether to buy the prescriptions they were prescribed or pay their rent or pay for food for their family. The cost of prescription drugs is pre preventative from, from wellness at this point. It's prevent making people make impossible decisions on whether they should eat, keep a roof over their head or take the drugs that are gonna keep them healthy and well. Um, just yesterday, I, I mentioned the call that we had for training we were talking about this and one of my volunteers spoke up and said that, you know, she just did the math and for just her prescription drugs for the year, she's going to be paying about $6,500 out of pocket this year. Now, you know, some people have the ability to pay that. There are other people, especially many, many older Rhode Islanders on fixed incomes. And I'm not sure how anyone expects them to be able to pay $6,000 for just their medications on a fixed income here in Rhode Island. Now, with that being said, we're talking about income. The, uh, between 2012 and 2017, the brand name, the annual cost for a brand name prescription drug treatment increased 58%. During that same time, the annual income for a Rhode Islander increased 5.6%. It's just, we can't keep up with it. So that's why we've decided to make this one of our major issues over the past couple of years to really try to tackle here within the state. Um, now, I don't want to go through every single bill and, 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 and bore you with, with all the details, but um, I'm just going to go through a quick ones that are in the house right now, a one or two sentence kind of synopsis on, on what they're doing, and I'll field any questions at the end. Um, so we have um, you know many different bills. Like I said, one of them that we talk about testimony. This bill drew hours of testimony in committee. Uh, it was held for further study, but it is the insulin cap bill. Um, there were actually, I believe, four different insulin cap bills introduced this year. Um, they were all heard in the same evening. The main, what they're doing is it, it's a cap for a monthly, you know, how much you would be capped at paying monthly. The difference between all of the bills are some people cap it at $100 monthly. There was bills that cap it at $50 monthly. And there was actually one that capped it at $25 monthly. Where those separate is certain ones, certain bills are set up so that monthly payment is susceptible to your, um, uh, susceptible to your deductible. And other bills had it so it wasn't susceptible to deductible. So what I'm hoping happens with this bill is, you know, we're really going to put our heads together, talk with everyone that's introduced them, look at these four or five bills that have been introduced and see what we can come up with. That's the best for Rhode Islanders. Um, you know, the testimony was hours long. We had many, many people calling in on this bill. Um, I think it will get momentum. I think it really will get momentum if it's given a chance. So that is our first bill.
Another bill uh, that we have uh, is uh, in that the, the one that original insulin bill that we had uh, supported was introduced by Rev Kennedy. It was 5196. But like I said, there's four or five of them that are equally as good. They all have great intention and, and I think come together and we'll be able to get something really good put together. Um, you know, 5244 is another bill um, that was introduced by Representative Edwards. And that bill what it does is give pharmacists the opportunity and directs them that they should disclose the lesser price substitution <clears throat> unless directed otherwise by a doctor. So what that means is if your doctor writes you a prescription for any type of brand name medication and it gets to that pharmacist and that pharmacist knows that the generic brand has these same same content, same chemical uh, composition, same strength, same quantity. It is pretty much the same identical drug. Um, they would be directed to, at that point, give you the generic brand, unless otherwise stated by the physician, no, you have to have the name brand. Um, as many of you probably know, the difference between a, a generic and a brain, uh, and a brand name uh, prescription drug can be extremely substantial. Um, so that's one way that, you know, one, another bill that would significantly lower the amount that you would be paying on your prescriptions. And it doesn't really cost anyone anything. The information is there. The drugs are there. It's just a pharmacist stepping in to make sure that you get the best cost, best price for your prescriptions. Um, so that's our second round. It's 5244. Um, another one in the house is 5249 which is the importation of wholesale prescription drugs from Canada. What it would do would be, it would allow the state to, as a whole, purchase uh, prescription drugs wholesale from Canada at the Canadian cost. I know you may say, well, wh why would we do it? In the United States, we pay by far the most for prescription drugs than any other country in the world. And, you know, it, it's not just for, for older older Rhode, Rhode Islanders. This is all Rhode Islanders. Um, you know, earlier we were talking about suicide prevention and a part of mental health recovery sometimes includes medications. And those medications can be extremely expensive. And you don't want that being a barrier to your child's wellness. It, this is going to make changes in lives around the state if we can put any of these bills, even one or two of these bills into place. Um, so the importation of wholesale prescription drugs, uh, we have that one. Uh, and then Representative Ackerman had put, um, put forth our drug cost transparency bill. Now what that does is it requires drug manufacturers to submit reports um, to the Department of Business Regulations on the cost of the prescription drug, why it costs what it does. If there are increases in it, what was the reason for the increase? What happened? Um, so those are the ones that are in the house right now. What we're also looking at, we have a bunch in the uh, in this in the Senate. A lot of them are are very similar to the ones we have in the house. Uh, the insulin copay. Uh, we have one other bill, um, SO three eight one, which caps out of pocket expenses. So monthly out of pocket expenses, it could cap. So it's not just pertaining to insulin, but this would be all drugs in general. Um, we, let's see, any other ones? Uh, uh, one, the most successful one so far has been what well, is now being, um, it was so rightfully and honorably named, um, the uh, Mary Ellen Goodwin uh, Colorectal Cancer Act. Um, that bill had made it out of the Senate, was passed on the floor, went to the House, and has been held for further study. Um, I, I really hope and pray that that, that bill does, um, you know, take off and, and get passed and, and signed into law. It, what that bill would do is prevent, you know, so let's say you go get your colonoscopy and it re requires further screening. It, it, it would pr prevent the cost of them charging you for those further screenings. It, it, would, it would prevent the cost sharing. It would really save money and eliminate barriers to a very, very deadly disease um, where it could, if, if treated and, and identified early, can be very curable. Um, but if it's not caught early, it, it can be very, very deadly. Um, so that is that, one. That, yep. Go ahead. That had Go a right. good hearing. That had a good yes. hearing. Yes. Very good hearing. Yes. 
so like I said, there are very, very important life-saving bills that have been introduced this session. Um, we are looking forward to working with anyone willing to work with us to help get these passed. Uh, if you have any more information, if you have any questions about any of these bills specifically, you can reach out to me uh, either, you know, ask a question now or, or after the meeting if you want to talk about anything specific. Um, but, you know, that's pretty much what we're doing right now. Um, you know, luckily we have a little bit of a chance to start working on this stuff. Uh, you know, for months we were working on the vaccine and age prioritization for the vaccine, which we we're very happy that the state decided to do. Um, and now we, you know, we are number two in the country at um, having people 65 and older vaccinated. Uh, you know, it's, it's well over 70%. Um, so we got that under control and we're, we're moving on to things that are going to affect us year after year, which we hope the pandemic goes away very shortly with the vaccine. But um, prescription drug costs won't go away unless we do something. So you know, we appreciate your time. I do have one quick question. Yeah. When you... Um... When you cap the cost to um, the individual, mm -hmm. does the uh, does the insurance company or does the drug company uh, make up the difference? Where does the where does that go, or some other entity? That's the catch with caps. Yeah. Is to be completely honest with you, those costs will get spread out amongst other people that are being insured under plans. From uh, you know, and I'm no expert in any of this, but these bills that cap the monthly cost, they're going to help. They'll help the end line consumer. They're not solving the problem completely, though. Right. They are not making the drug companies lower their prices. And what we might need we might need some federal help fund in that. Regard. Exactly. That's a little bit over my pay grade. Um, but you are you are exactly right, Representative. Uh, it's it's a step in the right direction. These cap bills, but to completely fix this problem, it would take complete reform of of the drug manufacturers and the way that they price and the scaling of that. Um, so you are definitely right. Like I said, this is not the perfect situation, but it is something that would give a lot of relief to a lot of families. It may increase the cost of other people that don't need those prescriptions. Um, but in the sake of the greater good, we're hoping that we can do that and, and help people that have some chronic diseases such as diabetes, get some relief and be able to, um, be able to take the life-saving medication while be able to afford their food in their house and, and, and other things they need Absolutely. in order to live. Because all of that is part of good health. Yes, yes, definitely. And just as well, just as much as just as important to our good health with diabetes is mental health. So I want to thank you all for your work on mental health and everyone that's in here uh, today from coming from someone whose oldest friend uh, took an intentional overdose and, and, and committed suicide about four years after high school. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult, difficult situation. Um, and it doesn't just affect the people that leave us um it stays right. with family members and friends for a long long time so uh, thank you for all your work i appreciate it uh if you wanted to send me that um the training uh power yeah. uh, pdf or or powerpoint or whatever you did that'd yeah. be great and i will share it out to whoever signed up today whoever's email address i have yeah, definitely. It's actually we we created it and then talked as a committee yesterday, and Tia can speak to this. We we started talking about like how can we get it out there, because we feel like it should we should really make it an active push to let people know how easy it is to speak mm. up on some of these issues in a virtual world. Um, and, and it's and especially I mean my the legislator website is just my favorite place in the world because I'm kind of a nerd and advocate but uh it's a powerful tool and and, and so much is there and it's really a, a great a great tool for anyone to utilize uh has AARP uh Rhode Island taken any uh steps to um to advocate for the continuation of the online um you know the the option to participate give provide testimony remotely we are looking into that. I am wait, you know, that we're, we're creating policy on that nationally right now as it as it kind of unfolds. Uh, I do know of a bill that was introduced, I believe, 
by Representative Flippy that would continue um, the streaming and whatnot of, of open meetings. Um, that is one that I, I did put a call into the represent to Representative Flippy, um, waiting to to hear back. I'm gonna call, call him again and hear back from him. And Mars Alex Marzakowski has one yes. too. Um, yes. And but I don't know if it necessarily. I read that one the other day, um, and I don't know if it if it really um, applies to the state house or yeah. to uh, local municipal boards yep. and committees. Yeah, what I was looking to do is we you know we have some model legislation um, that I'm looking to get from our, our Washington office on, on this specific issue. Like I said, we just really started digging into it as a committee yesterday. Um, but it's it's been something that has been very helpful for our volunteers, um, you know, to be able to mm -hmm. stay at home. And we did include a one page on the on the PowerPoint on the tips and tricks of, okay. uh, of providing testimony because there are certain things like print your testimony out because you don't want to be if you wrote it down and it's on your computer you don't want your screensaver covering it up in the middle of talking because then you panic right. <laughs> so Good you know, we, we've learned we, we've learned the hard way a few times so um i will definitely get that over to you uh, I, I i thank you for helping yeah. us get it out there and I, i'd be willing to work with you on that yeah. issue because i think it's oh, perfect important. great um you know anything i can do to help in that yeah. regard Oh, well, believe me, we're looking forward to getting back and having relationships and meeting people in person. But we think that virtual option is a great thing for many people. Yes, for so many people. Yes, I agree. Um, Terry, yes. I have a quick question. Sure. Yeah, I, I know I have heard Joe Biden, our president, talk about um, this prescription drug thing that he wants to do at a federal level and from 60 and up. I even heard him say instead of even 65 and up. Is that, I'm sure AARP is involved in that movement. So yes. you're doing local yes. um, state actions while that's going on at the federal level. I'm just curious. Yes, yes. So we have a team in Washington that works on, you know, the federal side of these issues while we have um, offices mm -hmm. in each, all, you know, 53 states actually, because we're in Puerto Rico and some of the islands um, that we, uh, uh, we work on local. Uh, so what we do is we have weekly calls with mm -hmm. all of us where mm -hmm. we'll give updates on kind of what's happening on the national side where they're at that week um and then we can you know feed back to what's happening locally and mm -hmm. find whether it's appropriate for our you know whether we should step in to talk to our federal dele delegation at any certain point to push some of these national initiatives um mm -hmm. another thing we're looking at too is um Governor Lamont from Connecticut and Governor Massachusetts uh, uh they just okay. put be a baker um they just announced earlier this week they're working on um prescription drug um, affordability bills statewide so they partnered up those two on a specific bill i don't know much about i gotta read into it um but i believe it is uh they 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 would like to prevent drug companies from increasing the cost of drugs on it more than two percent on an annual basis Mm -hmm. So there wouldn't be any huge incremental jump. I haven't read the legislation. I don't know much about it. I just read the article in the newspaper, but it's something that we're going to look into. So it's a hot button issue, and it's mm -hmm. something that many states are tackling right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it is very important. And luckily, we have many, many people that are, are fighting for it here in Rhode Island. And, um, you know, we're hoping that uh, we can, even a couple of these, you know, packages that we have, even a couple of them get in, it's going to help a lot of people. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, for the overview. Thank you for the question, Louisa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tia, did you, um, we're happy to have you this morning. Any, did you have anything to add? Tia, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Yesterday in training, we named Tia the captain. <laughs> so, <laughs> so either her name or her well, screen is If captain. you don't know, that's a big joke. This is my husband. And I say, you're only... You're not a captain. You're retired, you know, and you're a commander. <laughs> but anyway, but um, you're the I, captain. Matt, you have no idea how busy Matt is. I'm telling you, 24 hours a day, I would think. And Terry, thank you so much. Actually, I have an any any Zoom coming up in five minutes. Okay. Okay. So well, with that, thank you, Matt. I'll talk uh, to you. Matt. I'll just thank everybody for joining us this morning and uh
Um, I have a, um, if anybody's interested, I'll be joining uh, Congressman Cicilline will be joining me Sunday evening at six o'clock. So um, you're, it's, I have some press out on it. And I, um, if any of the buddies interested, I can send you the link um, to register. So um, I uh, thank you all for joining us for the conversation. We did record this. So I'll be putting it on YouTube and uh, I wish you all a good day and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank all right. You. Take care. Bye bye. Have a great day. It wasn't too bad. No, you were great. You were great.